Welcome to uh, Asia Society Japan, um, our second installment in the series Startup Nation Japan. And I'm very, very excited uh, with uh, today's speakers, uh, Jamie Rosenwald from Dalton Investment and Oki Matsumoto from Japan Capitalist here. Now, I want to very quickly um, set the stage a little bit of what we're trying to do here. Um, we actually think that uh, Japan is at a big inflection point um, and that there is actually new energy, new entrepreneurship and genuine reformation um, happening. And that's what we want to highlight here with uh, practitioners who actually do this. When you look at economic growth, where does it actually comes from? You see that entrepreneurship is absolutely key. If you raise the share of entrepreneurs in your society by about one percentage point, your potential economic growth rate actually goes up by about half a percent. So that's the focus on entrepreneurship, on venture capital, on startups. But on the next slide, please, let's have a look. It's not just about startups, it's also about legacy, the old existing companies. And this is quite tough for Japanese companies. I mean, look, put things in perspective. Uh, if you compare Japan and the United States, GDP is about you know, four, four and a half times bigger in America. Market cap is about seven times bigger. Interestingly, the target startups from the venture capital community is also about seven times larger. So that's quite comparable to the relative size there. But then look at the number of listed companies. In the US, there's 4,300. In Japan, there's about 3,800. That's just about the same. So the poor Japanese listed companies, they have, there's more of them who are competing in a smaller pond. And that's where it gets exciting. And that's where today's focus really is on a couple of guys, a couple of um, you know, managers who actually are trying to teach these old dogs, the legacy companies, new tricks. And let's have a look at on the next slide on some of the overarching attractions that you have. If you look at the listed universe here, and this is the topics universe there, and you compare it to how it has changed over the last 30 years, the number one change is the unwinding of cross shareholdings. Um, you see it used to be around half of the market cap tied up in the Keiretsu, in the Mochiai, that's down to about 4%. So really Japan has opened up you know, from an insider form of capitalism towards one that is now more open. And that, of course, means that the investment community also gets more involved. You also notice that foreign holdings, um, you know, have gone up from about 4% to just about a third in the market. So there is quite a big voice there. Second, uh, next slide, please. The other point is what is attractive about Japanese companies is, wow, these guys are unbelievably rich. If you look at the balance sheet, you find that corporate cash and liquid balances in Japan are unbelievably high. I think you all know that about half of Japan's listed companies trade below the book value. And from that perspective, as a global investor, that's something that makes Japan quite attractive. On the next slide, you also see that capital stewardship, when you look at what is the total uh, shareholder payout ratio, so the dividends and the buybacks, you see that Japan lags the global peers. Um, so that's something that attracts activists to Japan, lots of cash on the balance sheet, but low capital stewardship. So let's put pressure on them to raise the dividend to increase share buybacks. Next slide, please. The second big picture is that when you look at the economic performance at the return on equity, Japan actually has no superstars. You know that the ROE in Japan is about seven, 8% in the US, 15, 16%. 
But if you actually split this out between the low performers and the high performers, you see that, you know, Japan has this normal bell curve distribution. America has these superstars. And again, from an activist perspective, that's something that makes Japan attractive. Let's turn these companies around to become superstars. Next slide, please. Now, why are there no superstars? Is because the industrial structure in Japan is completely different from the United States. I mean, we already showed that the listed companies in Japan compete in a much smaller pond than America. If you split this by the different industries, you find that the top four firms' revenue share in the US is now more than 30% on average. In Japan, it's barely 12%. So Japan is excessive competition and America is more oligopolistic. And again, for an activist, that's fantastic because it means that there is some restructuring, some consolidation that can actually happen. On the next slide, please. Um, change driver, one of the things that is wonderful is that you know, the leadership of corporate Japan has actually become very old. Now, this is the entire economy. This is not listed companies. Japan has about 3.6 million companies. Um, you know, and you see of those 3.6 million company uh, the, where the owner is over 70 years old, it's about 2.5 million. And where there is no successor, it's about 1.3 million. So that's, again, a macro trigger where actual consolidation right now uh, could actually happen. So you've got great attractive valuations, rich balance sheet, poor capital stewardship, room for industrial consolidation, and a generational change that actually makes action much more likely than it did at any point over the last 30 years. And as a result of that, on the next slide, you have seen you know, the activists number uh, of engagements, uh, number of activist funds actually improving, uh, growing, and you see that the actual shareholder proposals by investors have also been improving uh, with that line. So it's an area of change, and I'm very, very proud and happy to have two of the leaders um, in the activist space to actually tell us a little bit on how you can teach Japan's old dogs new tricks and how new growth can actually come through. And I want to kick off with uh, Oki Matsumoto. Oki, the floor is yours. Please start with your self-introduction. Uh, so I'm Oki Matsumoto. Uh, I, uh, I started my career at Salomon Brothers back in 1987 and then moved to Goldman Sachs. Um, uh, the quick intro intro introduction of, of me. I used to uh, trade government bonds and those derivatives and, and those kind of things. And then later on, I did uh, uh, securitization and I founded the uh, special stations group for Goldman Sachs. So I dealt with the all capital uh, structure, you know, layers of the companies from uh, the top credit down to the, the, you know, the distressed equity and those kind of things. And then uh, uh, about 22 years ago, I created, uh, I founded the Manex group. Okay, and then uh, after I founded uh, uh, the Manex, uh, the, so I, uh, in, initial uh, service of Manex is to uh, get the retail customers to closer to the market. But I realized that uh, it is more important now to get the uh, uh, investors closer to the issuers. So that's why I started uh, managing active funds about uh, uh, one and a half years ago. Uh, in, after creating Manex, uh, I sat on the board of Tokyo Stock Exchange for five years. I sat on the, uh, the various uh, governmental uh, committees uh, to reform capital markets of Japan. And also I'm currently uh, sitting uh, on the board of MasterCard in, in the States. Um, the next page, please. So the way uh, we are doing uh, activism uh, uh, in in my company uh, is Sotaku Doji. So Sotaku Doji is a Zen saying. Uh, Sotsu is the sound of the uh, uh, baby bird uh, trying to hatch out, trying to get out of the eggshell. And then 
take the, the egg from inside. That sound is so true. And while the, uh, uh, the mother bird takes the egg to break the egg to help baby to get out of the eggshell. And the sounds of this pecking is called taku. So sots and taku, if it happens simultaneously, then baby successfully gets out of the eggshell and come to the world. I think the ideal way of engagement or activism is like uh, this sot taku doji. Meaning that uh, I will explain that later, but uh, there are many Japanese companies today, actually uh, CEOs of those companies, many of them are now trying to change. They can't really change the company yet, but uh, they are trying to change. They are, they are ready to change, but uh, they need some help. And here we come to help them to uh, execute those changes. By doing that, uh, we, can, uh, we can be a catalyst of the changes, and also uh, we can make it happen in a time, in a timely fashion and uh, in, in a very efficient way. Uh, next page. You know, the, what's happening in Japan is, uh, yes, uh, touched upon already, but uh, there are uh, a, a, a very important generational change happening. I am uh, 57 years old, becoming 58. Uh, when I uh, joined, Sarah, when, when I graduated uh, from the university, it was 1987, and uh, the, the, uh, the, the bubble economy was already kicked up. Uh, several, before, uh, several years before I joined, I, I graduated university, the Japan as number one, that famous book was written. But when I joined the you know, Salomon Brothers you know, after the university, Japan was already finished the peak. So since then, I never seen the, the Japan was really successful. So my uh, see, my former generation, who used to be running a Japan, corporate Japan, they had uh, uh, they saw the success experience of Japan uh, in Showa era. So um, uh, they have some natural uh, tendency that, uh, to believe that they don't have to change because they used to make a big success. But my generation, since we are in the uh, society, you know, Japan has never been shining. So we are more open to uh, accept the, the uh, best practices of the world, uh, global standards. Now the uh, CEOs of the Japanese companies are coming to my generation, uh, who are more open to those uh, you know, the changes or you know, the global standards and the best practices. That is a uh, very strong secular change, but that's a very important uh, phenomena happening uh, in Japan right now. And as you know, Japan's been promoting the uh, 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 corporate governance reform, stewardship code introduction, those kind of things. Uh, they've been doing it for like the last five years or six years or something. Uh, so it's been gradually changing, as Espa said, cross shareholding uh, went down the rack. Uh, but still, there are some final push was needed. But what happened was uh, uh, that this past one year, I think there are very important change happened. Uh, you remember that uh, uh, last year, uh, AGM of the uh, Toshiba, the activist proposal was rejected with a support ratio of say, of, uh, say uh, like 40%. This year in March, Toshiba called the uh, extraordinary uh, you know, uh, shareholders meeting and the same activists put the, the proposal. And I believe uh, they received say 40% support ratio from same activist group. It was same as the one year ago uh, at the AGM of the uh, Toshiba and uh, their proposal was rejected. But on top of that 40%, the, let's say, you know, 9% um, or whatever of the the, the vote came from the traditional Japanese institutional investors who now follow the stewardship code and then who vote independently, uh, not caring about the relationship with the issuer, but thinking about, but thinking about the more responsible uh, you know, the voting. So they put the vote uh, uh, with the, the activists. So now your know, support ratio becomes 40% to 49%. And then here comes the uh, retail investors, shareholders. 
they voted another 5% or 10% or whatever uh, 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 with the, the activists. But that put the support ratio from over 50%, let's say 60%. So last year, the, it was support ratio was 40%, but now this year, it was 60%. So that was really the kind of uh, uh, wake up call to the uh, Japanese uh, shareholders because uh, one vote really mattered. So that is kind of a uh, uh, making uh, uh, you know, uh, thing happened uh, this year. So now the uh, issuers really need to listen to uh, uh, you know, the shareholders. You know, at the AGM of the uh, MUFG this year, there is an ESG activists, you know, uh, saying that it's it individuals. So they were saying that uh, MUFG should change taken, uh, whereby, you know, the, the bank cannot lend money to companies who are not uh, good in ESG, who are not, uh, you know, uh, good for the uh, environment. And then uh, that uh, uh, a proposal got uh, received the support ratio of like uh, 20%. So that, you know, and those guys, those individuals, they came in front of the uh, MUFG's AGM, uh, uh, how do you say, Kaijo, the, the place, the, the place that they have, they, they held the AGM. So those guys put the kind of banner in front of the, that, uh, the building and they talk about the, uh, this, the, you know, this uh, ESG kind of activists. They didn't come to the uh, prime minister's office. They didn't come to the, the diet. They came to the AGM uh, uh, venue and then did this kind of activism, and then they received a twenty percent support ratio. This is again, you know, put a lot of pressure to MUFG now. It was twenty percent this year, but it can be forty percent next year. So they now really have to think about how to deal with this uh, this kind of proposal. So that kind of uh, change is really happening in Japan. So that creates a, a very interesting opportunity for activists uh, right now. Next page. Um, so the in case of uh, uh, in case of Manex and the Japan Catalyst, uh, we have a, a, a very unique position. Uh, we do we tend to know the CEOs directly. Um, uh, so in, in uh, the way I engage with a company, I talk to CEO. 101 directly. I don't talk to CFOs and uh, we, ju we just don't uh, uh, send, send letters. I meet with C uh, CEO 101 and then uh, uh, discuss intensively. And in, in 101 meeting, I tend to, you know, uh, how do you say, try not to have any others sitting in, 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 in the same room. And then uh, we have a very intensive uh, uh, discussion. You know, I have been running the uh, publicly traded company for 22 years, uh, uh, Manex Group, and also I've been in the capital market for like 35 years. So I can share the pain of the uh, CEO of the, of the companies. And also, you know, I can explain to them how the, the capital markets may see them. So we, we can share the many of those points and then uh, have a very, how do you say, intense uh, discussion. So by doing that, uh, you know, we've been uh, uh, making uh, some changes to the uh, Japanese companies. Uh, next page, please. Let me uh, give you the, just uh, uh, two examples very quickly. Uh, the JAFCO. The JAFCO is, as you know, the venture capital company, this is uh, venture capital company. And uh, uh, because of the uh, historical context, they used to be the subsidiary of Nomura uh, Holding. They had a, a, a huge chunk of the uh, Nomura Research Institute uh, shares. And that fact was been around for years. And uh, the many activists actually tried to uh, work on them uh, to have them sell the uh, NRI share and then uh, do the buyback. Uh, but uh, it, it never happened. Uh, we started the engaging with JAFCO. Uh, I uh, had been a, a uh, after you know, we had uh, we made some position uh, with Jaco. I started talking to their CEO Fuki, and uh, uh, last year uh, in, in autumn, during like uh, two or three months, I had uh, a dinner with one-on-one -on -one dinner with him for three times, 
and also one-on-one -on -one meeting for like four or five times in two or three months time. So I had the one-on-one -on -one meeting with him like eight times in two to three month period with average duration of two hours. And then, you know, he knew that uh, he should change this uh, capital structure because this is, this is ridiculous. But uh, that capital structure was given by his former, how do you say, uh, CEO or, you know, the former owner of the company, which was Nomura. So after he became, uh, when he became uh, president, that uh, situation was already there. But after that, you know, uh, uh, Nomura sold uh, their share, uh, uh, Jasko share. So Jasko became independent. But so, so the CEO felt like, uh, oh my God, you know, why, why the hell we are owning this uh, NRI share? But uh, he, he was not certain that, that if he could get up, he could uh, unwind that the historical context. So we had the intensive discussion, and then uh, he understood that uh, uh, he should change and he can change. And finally, he asked me to uh, uh, write a letter to the board. And then I wrote a letter to the board. And then uh, eventually, after only like a two or three month engagement uh, period, uh, they decided to sell 40% of, uh, of the entire holding of the NRI share and then use all those proceeds after tax to buy back the, uh, uh, all, all, uh, their own shares. So it, it, it took only like a two or three months. So it was very quick. There are many of those companies who are bound to the historical context and the CEO know that uh, they should change and that they are not sure if they can change. And where we, there, are, there are a lot of opportunities, we can help them to tell them, yes, you can change. This is the way you, you can do and then those kind of uh, change happens. Next page, please. Uh, so this is the how the uh, this Jacko engagement happened. You know, it took only two or three months, and then you know, share price went up uh, dramatically. So that was the case. So th there are many of those those cases. I'm working on the in a very large conglomerate as well. In in one case, uh, we are working on uh, the <coughs> the parent is listed, and uh, they have a uh, two subsidies. Yes, who are listed as well, and they, it's a kind of a convoluted situation. Um, and, but um, I'm talking to the CEO of the parent company, and then we basically agreed that uh, uh, they should change the governance of the their uh, subsidiary company who is listed. So in this case, it's kind of interesting. I'm talking to the CEO of the parent company who's got the uh, listed subsidiary, and he agreed to work with me to change the. Uh, the subsidiaries, you know, capital structure and governance. So there are this kind of uh, lots of opportunities uh, in the market. And uh, uh, so as uh, Jesper said, uh, there are uh, lots of opportunities uh, in Japan. And uh, uh, so to me, if this is really the kind of, uh, how do you say, treasure uh, in front of us uh, for activists, uh, for Japanese companies. So let me uh, stop here and then uh, I will turn the presentation to Jamie. Okay, thank you so much um, you know, for this great overview. Um, let me pass it on to Jamie. Um, Jamie, you've been doing this for this engagement investment for quite a while, right? I remember when you started out, you had hair. Yeah, you to have, exactly, just like you. Um, Oki, is, uh, is this the book you were talking about? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Japan is number one. It's uh, uh, when you mentioned it, I had to go to my library and uh, and pull it out. But um, for my talk today, um, we're going to be covering this book instead. Barbarians at the gate. Yeah, because uh, you and I are barbarians, and and I look like a gaijin, so I, I qualify more as a barbarian than you do. Um, so so what's a a white guy um, who happens to be five years older than Oki doing uh, talking to you about Japanese investing with the uh, the map of America behind him. Um, I started investing in J Japanese equities, uh, Kirin Beer and uh, Bank of Tokyo in 1972. So uh, that probably puts me investing in Japan more than anybody on this call, I suspect, or earlier than anyone on the call. Um, 
I worked uh, on Wall Street for two Japanese brokerage houses. One was uh, Nikko Shoken and the other was Daiwa Shoken back in the 1970s. And then after graduating from university, um, uh, going to business school at night at NYU, uh, worked for a, for a family office. And uh, today, uh, the family office that I work for is my own family office, and that's called Dalton Investments. It's named after a small uh, high school located on 89th Street between Park and Lexington in New York City. Um, so let's, uh, let's talk about the opportunity in Japan and why I, I think uh, it's barbarians at the gate today. Uh, let's go to the first slide. And uh, it's basically the, uh, the sort of the, one of the same types of slides that, um, that Jesper showed you, which the first slide is uh, essentially the cheapness of Japanese securities. And since we've already sort of covered that, you can go to the second slide if you can even move the slides. And if you can't, um, I'll take it from here without any slides. There you go. Now the second one, please. That shows you why Japan is cheaper than anybody else. The next one. La, 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 la. Okay. So this slide is Japan versus the US. On the left-hand side, at least for mine, uh, you see Japan is net cash on a corporate balance sheet basis. And the United States is more leveraged today than it's ever been uh, in my lifetime anyway. Um, and that, in my opinion, is due to the growth of an industry that basically happened during my lifetime, which is called private equity. Uh, the private equity industry, which really was created back in the 1980s when Barbarians at the Gate was written and when that deal with RJR Nabisco actually happened, uh, changed the way Americans look at capital allocation. It changed the way boards of directors are operated. It changed corporate governance. And what it did was it shrunk the number of publicly traded companies. Jesper showed you today there are about 4,000 uh, US companies that are listed. When I started my career, there were over 7,000. Um, what private equity has essentially done is it shrunk the number of competitors in each market, uh, whether it's US or Europe, and Japan hasn't even started that game, um, which is why we have balance sheets that don't make much sense in a world of 0% interest and in a world where Japan has lower interest rates than any other country in the world other than perhaps Germany, Jesper, and, uh, and maybe Switzerland. So, so why in the world have the Japanese corporate sector not taken advantage of this obvious arbitrage? You know, that is the question. And for me, investing in Japan, you know, is not only an avocation, but it is also my business. And uh, for the last 25 years, we have basically been engaging with Japanese in a, in a fashion that, that, that uh, Oki described, which is basically pecking at, the, uh, pecking at the companies slowly, quietly, nicely, and doing as much namawashi as we possibly could, um, even though I'm a, an ugly gaijin. So, so we tried desperately to do that. We have uh, eight people on the ground in Tokyo in our office and all of them are Japanese and most have a, a MBA from a US uh, university like NYU where I teach two of my students are in the, in, the, uh, in the office in Tokyo and then we have representatives of Columbia and Chicago, et cetera. So it's a good cross section of uh, US MBA programs as well as domestic, uh, we've got a mafia from KO, basically a bunch of KO grads. Um, so, so that's how we approach it, but we've been doing this pecking at the egg for years and years. And I sort of got sick of it and also got old enough that I had no patience anymore. And let's go to the next slide. Yeah, so, so what encouraged me to sort of up the ante and uh, try and go after the low hanging fruit was uh, the regulatory changes in the pan Japan that have started in 2014 um, and, and what really got me excited was the M&A guidelines in 2019. But what happened during that period of time was the number of independent directors in Japan exploded to the point where over 70% of Japanese company have a third of their board of directors as independents. And, and, and what Oki described at Toshiba really would never have been able to happen if you didn't have a good coterie of independent directors on the board who actually understood what fiduciary duty is. Um, which is sort of the basis of all corporate directorships. If you understand your, your, your fiduciary duty, you will behave differently and you will encourage management to behave differently. And the corporate governance code gives you a background and a basis for doing so. So what we've done or what we started in 2020 after the M&A guidelines was to list uh, 
London listed investment trust. So a permanent capital vehicle called Nippon Active Value Fund, NAVF space LN, if you, if you utilize a Bloomberg machine. And, and the concept was to have a publicly traded vehicle in, in the UK with a chairman of the board who basically was the bursar at Trinity Hall, Cambridge, uh, for the last 15 years and an investment banker at Rothschild before that. And the president of that advisory company is a lawyer in Japan from a law firm that I've used for the last 25 years. And so the concept was to engage management in a much more aggressive fashion with the ability to basically act like a man of war. Uh, now, for those who don't know what a man of war is, I would recommend Google. But for those who have a clue, it's essentially an 18th century warship that the that the British um, designed and would have something like 40 guns per side, etc. And so so what we've created is a British warship to basically a, approach Japanese companies. And for those who remember the first activism uh, campaigns in Japan, which started probably in 2003, um, they essentially ended very shortly thereafter in 2006, 2007, when a friend of mine named Warren Lichtenstein came up against uh, a management team at Bulldog Sauce. And Bulldog Sauce viewed shareholders as many Japanese companies still do today as just bothers. We are simply bothers and we are stakeholders and we are stakeholders after the directors, after the senior management, after the customers and after the suppliers. We are stakeholders. Well, welcome to corporate governance reform. We don't view it that way anymore, but in 2006, 2007, the courts reviewed Bulldog Sauce's case and what Bulldog Sauce's management had done was dilute shareholders dramatically to the detriment of not only um, Steel Partners, uh, which Warren Lichtenstein ran and still does today, but also to the other shareholders of the company. So it was a, a really dilutive um, exercise that management utilized to to maintain their control of the company, even though they didn't own any stock. So you have a management that doesn't own any stock and they view shareholders after themselves and their directors and the customers and the suppliers. So where, where are you gonna get to? Not very far, especially if the courts support you. And that's what happened in the case of Bulldog Sauce in 06, 07. Fast forward to 2021 and that it just in the last month, we have seen a company called Japan Asia Group, which was supported in its MBO by Carlisle, basically after losing its tender offer twice, institute a poison pill to fend itself off from the Murakami family. Now Murakami family is a well-known investor in Japan. Um, the, the family has had run-ins with the government multiple times, but today, sort of the leader of the, of the Murakami family in Japan is Aya Murakami, who's an incredibly thoughtful young lady. And so uh, Aya, she, she addressed the, uh, the dilutive effect of the anti-takeover provision by taking the company to court. And in 2021, the courts supported her uh, in that it required the company Japan Asia Group to withdraw the diluted warrant offering and basically allow the tender offer that the Murakami family had instituted at a higher price than Carlisle and the management to go forward. That unfriendly, unsolicited tender offer actually was a success. To my mind, the only and first, unsuccess first successful, unfriendly and unsolicited tender offer has actually happened in Japan and is closed. Now, what did the Murakami family do after succeeding in the tender offer? they turned around and they're selling the bits and bobs to Carlisle. Now, why do you think they're doing that? Well, the amount of money that is piling up on the sidelines and private equity in Japan today is astronomical. If you include KKR, if you include Carlisle and Bain, and by the way, Bain, for those of you who are interested in investing in private equity in Japan, Bain has been historically the most successful. Their um, 10 year plus IRR is something in the order of the mid 30% range. So obviously there's an opportunity in private equity in Japan. We worked with Bain and Japan Industrial Partners in 2007 to take the first public company called Sun Telephone private in an MBO, a public to private. Um, that was quite successful and Bain made reasonable money on that one. So, so I can imagine how much money they've made on other deals going forward. So, so today, 
you have the opportunity as investors to either ride the coattails of Oki and Monex or Dalton or Nippon Active Value Fund or a slew of others, including the Murakami family or Seth Fisher at Oasis. And I can run you down a number of others. But what's happening essentially is because of the corporate governance changes that you see in front of you. Each one of those changes was a was raising the bar and making it easier and easier for activists and investors to participate in the same way that corporate um, governance has changed uh, the United States after Ronald Reagan's uh, inauguration in 1980 and his laissez-faire attitude to corporate takeovers and changing control. And the beauty of Japan is that 80% of the listed companies in Japan are run by, I apologize for this, but salarymen. Salarymen, in my opinion, are men who run the company, professional managers who own no stock, who own, who have no interest or de minimis interest in the companies that they operate. Now, you'll see on 2016, if you can read it, it's pretty small writing, I apologize. But in 2016, the METI, Ministry of Economic Trade and Industry, changed the tax code to allow restricted stock compensation for senior management. And in their paper, they recommended that each senior manager and independent directors have three to five times their annual salary in the form of stock compensation. And restricted stock is so much better than a stock option in Japan because if you receive a restricted stock, you don't pay tax on it. In the old days before 2016, Japanese management would have to pay tax as if it was a Black Scholes present valuation of those stock options. After waiting five years and 10 years later, when the stock hasn't moved, obviously the manager is a little upset. He paid the tax up front. He gets no benefit on the back end. It doesn't take very long for him to say, dame des, no more stock options, right? Well, the government finally woke up and they're offering this concept of restricted stock. And we are seeing more and more Japanese salaryman companies instituting restricted stock plans. And what this will do is it will encourage management to think like owners and align the interests. For those who've listened to Charlie Munger as long as I have, aligning interest is what it's all about in equity investing. Align the management's interest with you, the shareholders, and you have a far better chance of making money. And my feeling is the more Japanese company that institute these restricted stock compensation plans, the more companies will be encouraged by Oki to go private or to raise the dividend because the management will be the beneficiaries of the raising of the dividend of the share buybacks. So that's really sort of my overview. Um, I'll give you one story before I let you go. Um, so Nippon Active Value Fund um, bought about 6% of a little company because we focus, you know, unlike Oki, we focus on small mid cap companies that are literally in many cases trading for less, less than their net cash and cross shareholdings on their balance sheets. I mean, it's, it, there's nowhere in a developed market that you can get such cheap opportunities. So, so I'm an old value investor whose grandfather worked for a guy named Ben Graham in New York in the 1930s. And I was told a long time ago that you should have a large margin of safety in your investment strategy. And I don't see any margin of safety in US investing right now. It reminds me a little too much of the Japanese um, 1980s bubble, which is when this book was written essentially. So, so for me, focusing on large margin of safety companies in the small to mid cap space in Japan makes a lot of sense. So we bought a 6% position in Nippon Active Value Fund in Sakai Ovix. We approached the management and said, it's time for you to do a management buyout. They said, no, thank you. We announced our friendly management buyout in London, which is where this company is listed, uh, our company, Nippon Active Value Fund, and the Nikkei newspaper didn't even pick it up. But luckily, the management, Matsuki-san, the CEO and president picked it up, and he invited our CEO, our president, uh, Mizuochi Sensei, to come and visit him uh, in Fukui Prefecture and to talk to him about something. And we had to sign a non-disclosure agreement in advance to do that. The lawyer, our lawyer, president of our, our advisory company goes to Fukui. He meets with Matsuki-san, the CEO. He meets also uh, Mizuho Shoken, uh, Mizuho Securities, basically investment banker, who he, is, he hears is basically backing Matsuki-san in a management buyout. So they didn't accept our management buyout in a friendly way, but they were gonna do it on their own. And then we negotiated for a while and he allowed us to participate in the form of 9% in the private equity after the tender for 100% in the MBO. We went back and forth. 
He announces his tender at 2,850 yen a share. And who, who comes along? The Murakami family. They say, oh, Jamie, too low a price, much too low a price. So Matsuki-san, during the tender offer, raises his bid from 2,850 to 3,000. Murakami family says, no, that's not high enough. They buy more shares. They get up to a higher level. Um, I got to tell you, in Japan, everything takes forever, and everybody's a beginner at this point. So what, what Mizuho tells them to do, Matsuki withdraws his tender offer because he only gets 62% uh, in favor rather than 66 and two-thirds, which was Mizuho's minimum for, for the MBO. And everybody does a bit of nemawashi, and lo and behold, the next tender offer that took four months to five months later to appear, they offer 3,810 yen a share. All of a sudden, they're willing to pay book value. Book value and six to seven times EV to EBITDA for those who are interested in private equity valuations. Uh, EV to EBITDA is essentially the baseline um, ratio that every private equity firm would utilize. So they're buying the company for book value, tangible book, at six to seven times EV to EBITDA. So, so, so the moral of this story is the following. Japanese management, let's give you a little bit of a hint, but Japanese management in doing this MBO of a 200 and let's say 20 million US dollar company, a 25 a billion yen company, the amount of equity that the management is putting up in our deal and in the deal that they're going forward with, the equity portion is 50 million yen on a 200 plus million dollar deal. And Ms. Mizuho Shoken is putting up the rest as well as regional banks in senior debt, mes debt, et cetera. But the management slice of equity, the actual real private equity piece is 50 million yen. And for those who do the calculation, it's less than a half a million bucks, guys. It's unbelievable. And that's because you can buy companies, even in an MBO at book value and six times EB to EBITDA. There is nowhere in the world that you could get away with this kind of game, except in Japan. And it's only because we are at the early stages of MBOs. We are at the early stages of change in control at premiums. And just to give you an idea, 3,810 yen a share today versus where it was trading at 1,000, blah, 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 a few hundred when we started buying it. It's an unbelievable win for us, but it's peanuts compared to how much the private equity guys and management is going to make if they do this right. So that's that's all for me. It's low hanging fruit. Invest with Oki. Look around for activists in Japan. I'm telling you, it's like shooting fish in a barrel. If that makes any sense to anybody. Wow, Jamie, um, you've certainly very very uh, exciting. I think we're going to have to get you over here to Japan uh, to shake things up a little bit. A little you bit. Don't, you don't let me in. You make me do a 14 day wait, man. And I've been, you know, I've had COVID. I've had my vaccines. And you don't want to let me in. Not my pro. Not my. <laughs> it will be gone. Don't worry. Uh, we we'd send you a special a special invitation. Um, absolutely fascinating. Oki, do do you want to you know maybe respond a little bit to to some of the things that Jamie addressed? I do agree with Jamie. You know, there are so many uh, low hanging fruits. It's just uh, completely cheap. Just ridiculous. There are so many of those uh, companies opportunities around. We just need to. We just need to, how do you say? We just need to, I mean, of course, if the private equity companies, uh, private equity fund come in, they can just buy them cheap. That's good, and they make money. But if we somehow you know, address this issue right, the whole Japanese capital market could become more active. You know, not only those uh, private equity funds make money, but also, entire market variation can be changed and that will be good for everybody. That is something uh, I really, you know, hope to see. And I think uh, we, 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 you know, we, I think we, uh, we should make it happen and I think we can make it happen. Um, okay, I just want to pick up on one thing and I think Jamie, you would sort of agree with it. I mean, it's, you know, if you've got the, 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 the black ship, you know, if you've got Warren Lichtenstein, if you've got Dan Loeb from Third Point, if you've got, you know, the Gaijin from, you know, hacking at uh, Toshiba, that's all nice and well. Um, what about the domestic investors? Why don't we see Sumitomo Trust? Why don't we see domestic 
you know, uh, fund managers taking this opportunity, which you say is a very, very obvious one, and I would very much agree with that. Um, you know, what does it take to get the domestic investors excited? And perhaps, Oki, you can, you can explain a little bit about how the Catalyst Fund is actually the first uh, uh, activist fund that mobilizes domestic retail investors, right? One thing about uh, Japanese uh, domestic investors is, as you know, Jamie said, you know, uh, for issuer CEOs, eighty percent of them are salaried men. It's the same thing for uh, inst institutional investors in Japan. I'm sorry, maybe those audience here, I'm, I'm sorry for, uh, for uh, saying this, but that, that is the case. So, so, but individual investors, they're not, they, they may be salaried men or salaried you know, uh, people, but when they manage their money, they employ themselves. Right? So they have eager, they want to make money. Right? So they, they so, so those individual investors, then they are not caring about, the, uh, how do you say, uh, keeping process right. They more care about making money. Right? So they are more, how do you say, the, the good, e uh, eager, uh, good, greedy people. I think uh, to mobilize uh, uh, those investors, with us, and then you know, uh, work on uh, work on the the, the uh, opportunities would be the uh, one good thing. Uh, and also, when, when I talk to the issuers, the CEOs, then I tell them that uh, you know what, 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 what I'm what I'm telling you is not only my idea. You know, the retail investors do think in the same way. By the way, those retail investors are your consumers, your users. You know the family of your employees, they are your kind of uh, real you know, stakeholders. And they have the same view. And, they, and, and, and the issuers tend to have uh, more ears to listen to those voices. I think the mobilizing of those people are actually are quite interesting. Um, I just want to clarify for those of you who don't know, and, and Oki, um, as you as you've noticed, is a, is a little shy sometimes, but uh, the Japan Catalyst Fund uh, is actually very unique. It's, it's the first fund that uh, is uh, funded um, not by pension funds, not by institutions, but by retail investors. And Oki set up the Catalyst Fund uh, about 16 months ago. Uh, started off with about $40 million just from retail, domestic retail investors. And that fund has grown to about 120 million and is growing very, very nicely now. So, you know, it really is, um, you know, um, as Jamie pointed out, you know, you've got the salary man mentality at the corporate level, the salary man mentality and incentives at the traditional fund management level. Um, but the retail investor, the domestic retail investor, the ultimate asset owner in Japan, that's actually where the big change, um, you know, is actually starting to come from. Jamie, what's, what's, what's your view in terms of, you know, sort of the, the you know, when, when you try and align incentives, you know, getting management, um, you know, incentivized with the investors, with those restricted uh, stocks. What, 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 what is some of the pushback uh, that you're getting? Because I can tell you in, uh, you know, when I was involved with the Abe administration for this whole Hataraki Katakai Kaku, and, you know, one of the things obviously was, what about Seika? You know, it's not about seniority, it's about pay for performance. And the pushback we got from the Kedan Ren in particular was unbelievable. It was like a bulldozer coming at us. No, we can't have pay for performance. What 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 is what is your interaction with management like? Look, um, Jesper, we come you know trying to encourage senior management to become owners like we are, and and we are absolutely flabbergasted. Although I've been working in Japanese equities now for nearly fifty years, but. But it continues to amaze me how they look at us like we're some weird 
entity from a different planet and say, we are not that greedy. We are not that interested. We, are, we don't believe we necessarily deserve it. And that we shouldn't just simply be the beneficiaries just because we're senior. So our counter argument is, of course, then you should handle restricted stock the same way that Mikitani san handles equity at Rakuten. You should make everybody a restricted shareholder in the company. And yes, you can utilize seniority for those who are more senior, they have more restricted shares, but make everybody a shareholder. I mean, I don't know about your daughter uh, at University of Spoiled Children, but literally, you know, he's gonna be offered an opportunity to work at Facebook or Google or any of these. And literally her compensation, whether she works in the art department or the legal department or the finance department, it doesn't matter. She's going to be offered stock immediately as a first year worker for the company. And every major well-run company in America is offering first year the opportunity to own equity. And in Japan, you can't even convince the senior management to own equity. So what is wrong with this picture? And what I'd like to ask Oki, because he sat on the board of the Tokyo Stock Exchange for so long, I'd like to ask him whether he really believes that the Tokyo Stock Exchange reforms that they're trying to institute next year is really a way to consolidate and create Japan leaders, Japan global leaders, get rid of these little companies that trade on the stock exchange and waste everybody's time and don't make the Tokyo Stock Exchange any money and can get consolidated entities so that you have one leading pump company to compete with you know, the, Jap the US uh, pump company one leading or two leading auto companies instead of 20 of them, one leading aerospace business, one leading defense business. You know, there's so much as Jesper, as you, as you pointed out, too many companies, in every industry, no chance for any margin. And I mean, I believe in the full employment act. You don't have to fire anybody, just redirect the capital allocation and get people to own stock. So they will come up with wonderful new ideas and new ventures within the old line company. I agree. You know, the, the FTC concept uh, of Japan is uh, completely crazy. You know, they say FTC, the fair competition inside Japan. What the, what the, what the hell what? are you talking about? <laughs> they have to compete in the world, right? right? So, right. so they, 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 are, they are crazy. The TSC, they, their reform is kind of nothing. It's, uh, it's, very, um, it's very poor. You know, uh, but it, it's good. It, it's a start. I, I don't want to say it's a good start. It's a start. They started changing the, you know, the, um, they started changing the, um, this, uh, you know, the listing kind of, uh, you know, uh, sale, uh, you know, the market structure. So that is good. But uh, what they are saying is really almost nothing. You know, so we have to, we have to keep pressing TSC to change the, uh, to reform the, the market. I mean, I have to say ab ab among the 3,800 companies, maybe half of them should be delisted. You know, it's, but, the, but, but, but my, my point is, I, I can complain for long about the Japanese capital markets, but flip side of that is that is creating a lot of opportunities as well. Yep. You know, so this uh, crazy regulation or some stupid thing does create a lot of opportunities. And then we should pursue those opportunities. And interestingly, that will lead into the improve the market, to, to reform the market. So that's something uh, Completely agree. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's very interesting. I think that, look, the, the opportunity is there. Um, and Jamie, you and I remember, remember in, uh, when I was at the great house of S.G. Warburgs in 1992 or something like that, we went through the list of the companies that, uh, you know, had uh, net, uh, had no debt, right? Okay. And, um, you know, every time I, I change my company, I, I look at the same list and it's the same list. Uh, you know, so, so there's, there's a market failure here, right? Because the opportunity set has been obvious, um, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Um, the interesting thing is um, that, you know, the alignment of the national priorities with the changes in the governance code, with the changes in some of the tax measures to allow consolidation, 
with the change also in the public perception that it's okay to have a hostile takeover bid, right? Um, which, you know, two, three or four years ago, you couldn't find a lawyer who would represent you. Right. Now, lawyers will actually do this, right? So I think, you know, together with this generational change, you know, Japan really this time is actually at an inflection point. Now, having said this, um, let's go to the audience. I think we've got a, a couple of questions. Sawako, why don't you uh, tell us what you've got? Sure. Um, just to kick off, uh, this is a question from Marcus Okuno uh, to both of you. Um, how does your team at Monix and Dalton screen your targets to engage? Well, we do just a desktop analysis to, to start with, and then we, we can find uh, the many cheap companies. And then we check the value, and then and then I, I in, in case of me, and then, and then and then we discuss about the, the engagement ideas, and then I check the board if I know any of them, if I know CEO, because uh, I'm I'm doing this uh, uh, you know plan not for my hobby but for the job. So if so, there may be like a ten opportunities. Uh, and then there may be like five companies where I know the CEOs, I know the board, and so that I can work on that company more effectively and efficiently. So I go, we go those kind of a screening uh, quickly and then start looking to the company. That's how we do. Yeah. So look, um, for those who uh, spend a ridiculous amount of money every month on uh, having a Bloomberg machine or the availability of the Bloomberg database, I would uh, I would recommend the same way we when we when we launched the Nippon Active Value Fund, which was targeting salaryman companies. Um, historically, for the last twenty five years, um, we've been able to outperform the the index, which of course the index didn't do anything for twenty five years. But we've been out, able to outperform the index by about seven hundred basis points a year by focusing on the only the twenty percent of Japanese companies that are actually owner operated, like SoftBank and and Rakuten, and you know the the the, the, the owner operators who for those who don't realize that Japanese entrepreneurs are no different than global entrepreneurs. They are just as hungry and just as greedy and just as talented um, in many respects. So, so we've been able to outperform the market just by focusing on the entrepreneurs in Japan. But, but when we started Nippon Active Value Fund, which is really targeting the 80% that we've never spent any time on, we utilized you know, coming up with companies that are trading at less than EV to EBITDA of three times. And because Bloomberg doesn't include the cross shareholding valuation in its EV um, calculation, we, we added back the cross shareholding valuations. And what we came up with was over 250 companies that, that were less than three times EV to EBITDA and probably over 50 companies that were trading for less than net cash. So, so you know, you're buying a company that's worth more dead than alive. Um, so you can do this screen the same way our team did it. And then as Oki says, you, you screen within a screen by, do you know the management? Is there a major shareholder on the board that you might know an institutional shareholder? Um, is the you know, cross ownership amongst the government and other shareholders diverse enough to actually make a difference and are foreign sh foreigners a large shareholder already? Or is there an activist already on the shareholder register? So these are all things that any normal screener who comes out of business school could easily do for you um, and they do for us. Uh, we have a question from Dominic Henderson. Um, do you expect to see any changes in the rules or interpretation of the rules to allow investors to work together to push for change? You talking about uh... I, I think they're talking yeah, yeah. about I, I, th I think in, in, yeah, in, in the states I don't know. Well, you know, uh, uh, you, 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 you're talking about this uh, collusion issue, I guess? Concert, concert parties, mm. probably. Concert parties, which in the United States are much more flexible yep. in the SEC's rules and regulations of shareholders being able to speak to one another yep. and actually talk to each other about um, what companies might want to do. There's a lot more flexibility in the United States in concert party discussions. In Japan, you have to be very careful. Uh, who you speak to, whether you have an NDA with them or not, non-disclosure agreement, whether whether they're also a shareholder, and 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 our lawyers have been very careful in who we 
we have to engage with, um, especially if they're already major shareholders of the company. So yes, um, we hope that the rules and regs for concert parties is improved and follows the evolution uh, that the United States and Europe have sort of followed. But um, as of today, we are still pretty much in the dark ages. Okay, any additional comment? I, 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 I don't, I agree with, I, I don't think it will change soon in Japan. I, unfortunately. unfortunately, I think, but still there are some, uh, you know, uh, clever ways to somehow, you know, with my being mindful uh, to somehow, you know, uh, share the opinion or view among investors. Okay, can I ask, uh, in, 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 uh, as a follow up, can I ask a question here? Um, you know, the, the, you know you're, you're, you're very involved, um, you know, you're a respected peer um, amongst, uh, you know, the corporate leaders in Japan. Um, many of them you, you went to high school with, you went to university with, um, and also the regulators. Um, now, when you set up the, you know, engagement fund, the activist fund, right? Uh, what was the reaction? Was was there was there resistance? Was there, you know, were you what, what was particularly from the from the from the FSA from the regulator, but also from your peers? Because it's the first time that it's a domestic fund, right? Well, they they welcomed, they liked it. I think there are two reasons. One being that uh, because they know me, you're such a nice guy. That's and and the second. They act, as I said, they actually are those who want to change. They're not 65 years old. They're not 70 years old. They are the guys in my generation, as I said, they been feeling somehow, you know, wh why we are bound to this Shoah context, you know, um, and we know that the, our, our, our juniors, like a 10 years younger than us, like a 40s, those guys, they don't care. They, they care nothing about the Showa type of the management. So we know that they will change how to run Japanese companies. So we are in the position, if the regulators or my peer, you know, CEOs, they are in the position, unless we make change, our younger guys will do change. Are we just a way to see that? Or we are going to change that? I think they're actually, you know, not all of them, but many of them are thinking that we, 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 we should do the people, we should be the generation to make, make changes. So when, when I started this engagement fund, regulators and Jeff, FSS and METI, I have many friends there. And, uh, you, know, you know, many, many friends in the, the corporate sector as well. But generally speaking, they like it, they like it. So, Oki-san, can I ask you a question? Uh, apologies for, for jumping ahead of the, of the line. But, but today is very different than when I started investing in Japan in the 70s. Um, today, the largest shareholders in Japan happen to be number one, the GPIF, which happens to be the bureaucrats at METI and the FSA. It's their own pension fund, and they happen to be the largest shareholder. And the second largest shareholder, or perhaps today the largest shareholder, is the BOJ through ETFs, right? So if you consider... That, that there is this alignment of interest with your generation who are the retirees who have the most money in the pension system or who are supporting the BOJ in one respect or another and the government's profitability. You know, is this truly a reason why the government should continue to support corporate governance reform, more independent directors, because they're the largest shareholders? I mean, the management certainly aren't, but the government bureaucrats are. Well... It's, it's it's kind of tricky question. G, GPIF, IF, the the owner of GPIF fund are us. Yeah, your bureaucrats. No, 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 no. The money is our money. Your money, yes. Okay. So and the, and the and the bureaucrats. The bureaucrats may be the a uh, little bit part of the administrators, but. The, uh, the beneficiary owner, beneficiary owners of the GPIF are Japanese people. Okay. Right? So we are the, we are the shareholders. Um, so maybe I was thinking actually, but uh, actually GPIF should uh, how do you say distribute the um, pension, not in cash, but in like ETF. 
<laughs> we have those. That's a, that's a great idea. And then, you know, it will compulsory force the people to think about share price should go up. And then if the, the PM or what, whatever the politician do something stupid to be bad on the uh, stock market, they will go, what, what <laughs> are you doing? That, that, that is a, a good way to change the market. And uh, as regards to BOJ, yes, they, have, they do have ETFs, but I, th I was thinking actually, you know, uh, they should have Japanese issuers to buy back those ETFs. I mean, in other words, BOJ, so the Japanese issuers, they have a tremendous amount of cash. Right. So we create, uh, 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 and then so there's a cash in the, the issuer side, uh, there's the ETFs in BOJ. It can be matched. Mm -hmm. So BOJ uh, doesn't have to sell ETF into the market. They sell ETF into the issuer. And the back issuer to the issuer. By, by and back. By doing that, still, you'll be talking about uh, there are about 250 trillion yen or something sitting in the Japanese uh, listed companies. And the BOJ, uh, the ETF, uh, ETF that the BOJ bought is only like uh, Yes, I should know better than me, but maybe like only like 50 trillion yen something. That is just 20% of the cash. It's, 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 it's very interesting because I, I think that the, the BOJs, I mean, the BOJ basically owns about 11% uh, of the Japanese market. Um, nobody has ever unbundled an ETF. Uh, because obviously, you know, maybe fast retailing, you know, would be happy to, um, you know, dispose of, swap some of its cash for the equity that the BOJ owns. But, um, you know, the 500th company in the ETF, uh, which is a dinky little this, that or the other, is not going to do that, right? So there's, a, there's, there's an issue here, right, um, in terms of how will the Bank of Japan actually, uh, uh, actually get rid, um, you know, of the ETF, if ever. Right. Um, of course, when you go and visit them, they tell you, don't worry about it. We will never sell. Uh, this is now now part of the national project here. Right. But that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a separate topic there. Let's go on uh, to another question from uh, one of the participants. This is a question with regards to education. Um, I think you um, uh, touched upon um, your team members um, and where they were educated. Um, but um, with regards to the, uh, the big difference between the US and uh, the Japan uh, mar market capital and the number of ventures and market participants, it, do you think it may be because of the difference in the education system? What do you think, both of you? Oki, okay, why don't you take that one first? Uh, you know, People, people, I mean, those days, you know, people can read many things from the internet and blah, blah, blah. You know, I never listened to teachers. <laughs> so people, people talk a lot about education, but education is, I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I think that people overestimate the power of education. I mean, education is very important. But it's not a teacher system. It's not, it's not a school system. Education can be done by people themselves. As long as there is a, a kind of, a, you have, a, you have the right goal setting, you have a kind of right role model, then people will learn themselves. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think that the education system itself in the States versus Japan is making a big difference. I think it's more like a role model or goal setting. That kind of uh, thing is different. I mean, in the States, to be an entrepreneur and make big amount of money is viewed as a good thing. And people talk about it. And it is not the case in Japan. That's it. It's not the education issue. It's more like a role model and that kind of uh, issue, I think. Um, from what my team tells me, Oki, uh, in the middle, mid, what we would call in the United States, the middle school, um, you're actually taught that the nail that sticks out too far should get hammered down, uh, the wheat that is too high gets cut, um, and that 
that showing uh, wealth is a bad thing. And uh, in a country where shame is really utilized uh, dramatically in, in schools or anywhere else in organizations, um, it's, it's really ugly to, to be different and want to, want to you know, gain wealth in, in such a society. So, so it's, as you say, it's very hard to provide examples, um, especially when the, when the media doesn't um, support some of the big winners uh, in Japan, like uh, Mikitani-san or Son-san, et cetera. So it's, uh, you know, I asked Son-san at one of his conferences uh, why the Japanese investors hated him so much. In the old days, his stock was trading at, you know, a quarter of, uh, of its breakup value. Um, and and he, started la he sort of laughed at me saying that, no, no, has nothing to do with Japanese investors hating him. It's just that they don't understand. <laughs> Um, so, so that was his perspective. Um, as far as education is concerned, you know, um, unfortunately today in my class at NYU, I teach second year MBAs of a course called Global Value Investing. And so two of my students, it's very rare actually to have Japanese students in uh, top 10 business schools today in the United States, whereas in the 1980s, I think it was much more prevalent. Um, and companies actually um, paid for the educations uh, for their Japanese executives. But um, sadly, what happened in the 1980s when those Japanese executives came back to their companies, they were viewed as like half gaijin and they were never elevated to the CEO roles even though they had this extra education. At least that was how it was explained to me. But um, yeah, I think that there has to be a change within the sort of CFO role in Japan to understand the allocation of capital and maximizing allocation of capital. And, and that there is no example in Japan really to do that. And, whether you get an MBA in the United States and you learn about EVD EBITDA or, or, you, or you join the private equity club or you join the venture capital club or you join you know, the, the, the consultant club as my son is doing today at Columbia Business School when you know, God forbid he would wanna go where dad teaches at NYU, it's not good enough for him. Um, but nonetheless, you know, these are the kinds of things that you learn at these schools. And as you say, you only get out of school what you want. Um, it's, it's no panacea, but um, it definitely creates it creates examples of how you can manipulate or change your balance sheet and income statement to uh, to affect change at the company level. So you've dissed me as an educator. I've been doing this for ten years at business school, so so I'll I'll take it as a punch. But nonetheless, um, it's it's been a great recruiting tool for me to get really smart Japanese who went to Ko and then are getting their MBAs at NYU. Jamie and Oki. Absolutely fantastic. We could go on. Uh, we've got um, actually a whole slew of questions here, but um, you know, it's a, it's a breakfast meeting here in Japan, and Oki's got to get back to work to create some value for his shareholders, right? right. And it's <laughs> so, wine o'clock in LA, baby. It's so wine one, I want to. It's wine o'clock in LA. This is very good. The Japanese work, the Americans drink. Um, there you go. Um, but listen, um, two things. Um, first of all, um, anybody in the audience uh, who does have follow up questions for uh, either uh, Oki or for James, um, you know, please don't be shy uh, to contact us. We'd be happy to direct it. Also, um, uh, Jamie and Oki, I understand both of your funds uh, are open for uh, investment. Um, so if there is, um, you know, anybody who has any deeper interest, um, you know, this can also be, um, you know, facilitated in one way, form, shape or another. And, um, you know, most importantly, I want to thank everybody, uh, you know, Jamie and Oki for, you know, a good and spirited discussion with lots of facial expressions uh, uh, coming in as well. And uh, I hope that we can reconnect um, at some point in the future. Uh, I look forward, uh, you know, to hosting, um, you know, the next installments um, of this series here at the Asia Society and uh, look forward to engage with all of you uh, in the audience at some point in the future. Also, one word, we want to thank our partners from the Silicon Valley Japan Initiative um, who have co-hosted this together with Asia Society Japan Center. <laughs>